Hi there, welcome to the show. And it's lovely today to welcome to the studio a member of that great family of actors, the Ottos. Miranda Otto, daughter of Barry and Lindsay, sister of Gracie. Miranda is probably best known to a wider audience from her role as the warrior princess Aeowyn in the Lord of the Rings films, but there's much depth and breadth to her career on both sides of the Pacific and in Europe that speaks of a good spread between theatre and TV and film. She's worked alongside some other great actors and been directed by some very big names. Most recently, she's been completing a film called The Homesman, directed by and starring Tommy Lee Jones, and another film, Reaching for the Moon. This last Last one is the story of the love affair between the American poet Elizabeth Bishop, played by Miranda, and the Brazilian architect Lota de Macedo Suarez, I hope I'm saying that correctly, played by the Portuguese actress Gloria Pires. It's a terrific story and we'll find out more about it today. Miranda Otto is our guest. She's chosen the music that she'd like to hear us play today. Here's the first. Incomparable Billy Holiday and the Teddy Wilson uh, band with Gloomy Sunday and chosen by our guest today, Miranda Otto. Miranda, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice that's, to be here. That's a good song, isn't it? It is. It's a great song. Um, I, I chose it in particular. I mean, there's so many great songs I could choose, but I, I chose this in particular because Elizabeth Bishop um, knew Billy Holiday. And, um, did she? She did. Um, she actually introduced her to people. She used to go and see her sing. And she said, if anybody was ever to put my poems to music, I would like her to sing them because mm. I like the way she phrases long words. She, she loved her, her sense of meter and How rhythm. interesting. Yeah. Who was Elizabeth Bishop? Elizabeth Bishop was an American poet, um, I suppose came into her own starting to be poet in sort of like the 30s and um, in this film that I made it's, it sort of begins with her life in the 50s when she's um, very close to turning 40 and another reason I chose this song was because she was in a really bad place I think at the beginning of the film she'd been in a relationship with another woman that that hadn't ended up working out and she was in New York and she was kind of in that New York thing where everything's sort of very closed up and in winter and then she decides to leave New York and go to Europe but she goes via Brazil and then she goes via Brazil and she stays there for 15 years. She stays there for 15 <laughs> years because she falls in love yes, when she's she, there. Yeah. With we won't give away the whole story of the film, sure. but it's it's important to discuss some of it with a woman who couldn't have been more different on the face of it. Yes, I mean, culturally, physically, in every way, in, in her manner and personality, just sort of real opposites, except for their brilliance and their love of beauty, which I think was something that really drew them together. So what sort of a woman was Elizabeth then, do you think, Elizabeth at that time? At that time, I think she was quite broken. She's an incredibly sensitive woman, which I think, which is what made her a poet, really. I mean, it was written on her report card at school, this girl is doomed to be a poet. And I think that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, she lost her father when she was nine months old and then her mother was taken away to an insane asylum when she was five. And then she was sort of buffeted around from different families and moved around a lot, but was very much alone in the world. Um, and she was a lesbian when being a lesbian was what? Well, she was very discreet about that. And and even though you would say that she was a lesbian, she, she had a number of relationships with women, she was also very in love with Robert Lowell at one stage. And there was a point where he actually asked her to marry him, but and she was incredibly in love with him, but um, she felt that he she sensed his instability and felt that, that it would destroy her mm. in some way, that, that the coming together of them would actually end up destroying her, which was very sad. But they, they remained wonderful friends and um, have incredible correspondence, and she really um, looked to him to um, sp speak about poetry, mm. and, and they looked at each other's work a lot. So she's introduced to this um, Brazilian architect, Lota de Macedo Suarez. I think we saying that correctly. That's very good. Thank you. Uh, by a mutual friend, Mary, who yes. was the girlfriend of Lota. Yes. And had been at college with, with Elizabeth in yes, New York. Yes, at Vassa, yeah. So she, can, she gets to Rio, she looks up her old friend, Mary, meets the girlfriend, Lota, and the two of them fall in love. Now, what was Lota like? She's an incredibly dynamic um, woman from a, a privileged background um, 
with an, once again an incredible eye and sense of beauty, but someone who's just uh, amazingly magnetic, like the center of attention mm. and so self confident, and just one of those people who's always succeeding. She's just a, sort of a natural born kind of winner. Anything that she sets out to do, she does, and she's a really refreshing character in that way because I, I love it. She's at one point she says, "Of course I do. I want I want everything. Of course I want everything." and she sort of doesn't make any apology for, mm. for who she is and She's what she appetites. wants to do. She has got appetites. So <laughs> Elizabeth is, the way it's portrayed in the film, in your character, she's quiet, she's reticent, she's unsure, she's broken, in your words. Mm. But she's a very determined poet. Yeah. And I thought that you brought along an example of her reading some poetry. I think it would it would add a lovely flavour if we could listen to just a bit of this. It's a, What's the poem what, that we're um, listening to? This is Roosters. She made this recording with Robert Lowell, uh, I think in the 30s. Uh, it was quite early on in her career. And um, it, what, I, what I loved about f- finding this was uh, I then found another recording of when she was older and her voice just changed so much in that time. But in this, you sense this, um, she's got a very high voice and this real sensitivity. She hated having to read her own poems. So you can sense her um, um, awkwardness in her own skin when she's reading. Recorded in the 30s, the voice of the American poet Elizabeth Bishop, and she's the subject of this film called Reaching for the Moon, starring Miranda Otto as Elizabeth Bishop. How did you find this character? How, how did you... Because I have to say, I'd never heard of her. I didn't know her either. I didn't know any of her work. And then is she, I thought, a, is really she a major poet? You know, she she is. She's sort of like a poet's poet, really. I mean, a, a lot of poets would know her work. And certainly on the East Coast of America, because she was from Vassar, she's she's studied in the East Coast. And um, uh, an Irish gentleman I know really knew her work well because the Irish all study their poets. But no, generally, she wasn't... Uh, she wasn't a, a kind of um, self-promoter in any way. She kind of really um, moved away from, from any of that. She she was very shy and, you know, she spent 15 years in Brazil. And the reason that, you know, she, she was the Poet Laureate, she won the um, Pulitzer Prize, she, she was actually quite awarded, but it was really Lowell who um, championed her a lot and kept sort of pushing her forward in a lot of ways because... We we won't go into what happened at the end of the relationship mm-hmm. with uh, with Lota, but did she find did Elizabeth find happiness later in life? Uh, she had another relationship with with a woman, which I, I think was a really wonderful love affair as well. Mm. Um, but I, I think her life was was always quite troubled, troubled with alcohol and and just troubled with her sort of extreme sensitivity. And what did you do for finding this? I mean, when when you were offered this role, was it grab it with both hands and say yes, please, or did you take persuading? No, it was grab it with both hands and say yes, please. Uh, the funny story is with this role that um, I, I received it, and at first I, I couldn't kind of believe i thought maybe it came by email from my agent in america and i thought perhaps she'd sent me the email by mistake and it was meant for someone else because it was such a good role i thought oh someone else would have snapped this up and then it was all set to happen and then there was a problem with dates with another job that i was working on and i thought that it had gone away and i kept saying to people people saying you're going to brazil to do that film and i said well supposedly i'm not but i still feel like the role is mine I, i i won't believe until they actually start shooting that i'm not doing it and then um, late one night I got this phone call from Bruno, the director, saying, I think there's a way we can make it work out and I pretty much had to get on a plane straight away. The f- the house that you filmed it in, in, in Rio, well, outside Rio, yeah. is absolutely Stunning, f- yes. Fabulous. The, the arch of the roof of that is is meant to look like a woman's back. That it's oh, an Oscar it's the, Nehemiah building. An Oscar actually. Nehemiah building. I yeah. read that, and yeah. the and the surrounding landscape is just beautiful. So luscious. The the garden is Billy Marks, and they just restored the garden back to to that. It had taken them sort of like ten years to get it back into that shape. The role requires you to age about fifteen years. Mm-hmm. Was that tough? That how, was tough because it was it? sort of from about 40 to 55 and, and I wanted it to be subtle but I really felt that there was a difference in her voice over that time that she kind of centred into herself in some way that w- when she arrived she's quite uncentred and um, and also I, I wanted something to happen with the physicality because I love, oh, I love love stories that are about 
I'm going to cry. Well, go it's on, terrible. that's okay. There's tissues um, here. I, I find love stories about young people just so dull and I really love love stories about um, people who are more mature who are at a point in their lives where perhaps if it doesn't happen, it will never happen. Why does that touch you, do you think? Um, Because I just think it's more... Um, it's kind it's of more sad, profound. Though. It's more. It's got more depth to it. So, um, oh gosh, that's really silly. No, it's not. Um, I think it's very touching. You're going to make me cry <laughs> next, and if I start crying, I'll start coughing. So, but let's hear. Let, why don't we hear some music? Sure. So you can you get can myself, myself together. To the tissues. What are we hearing next? Is it one note samba? Yes, it is because I, I just this isn't actually from the period. This is from a little later, later in the '60s. But I, I guess I wanted to contrast the idea of coming from that kind of gloomy Sunday kind of New York claustrophobic kind of place and then arriving in Brazil and just feeling the kind of embrace of the, the warmth of the people there and, and what an amazing sensation that must have been. Antonio Carlos Jobim and his piece called One Note Samba, chosen by our guest, the actor Miranda Otto. You said that the, the teachers at Elizabeth School said she was doomed to be a poet. Were you yeah. doomed to be an actor, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, hanging around the theatre when I was younger, um, I couldn't help but be seduced by that world. Hanging around the theatre but hanging around in your family. Yes, yes. Yeah, hanging the around the theatre, watching my dad on stage and, and, you know, being around what was the old Nimrod and now is Belvoir Street. And I don't know, something about that gets into your blood did barry ever say to you barry otto your father did he ever say for god's sake don't ever be an actor or? no he wasn't that kind of parent he was he was so encouraging of me being an actor always whereas i think as a parent i would be with my daughter more oh really think about it you know does she show signs yet or? yes oh, oh yes. Good. well yes <laughs> you do, do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. where were you born uh, i was born in brisbane mm. um, tell me about your mother my mother was also an actress um, until she had me. So she was, a, she was a school teacher, but she also did a, a lot of acting and voiceovers and those sorts of things. And um, and then when she had me, her other great passion was design. So she thought that that she and Dad couldn't both be working in the theatre at night and have a little baby. Um, so she started um, making clothes and mm. a shop, and so now she's still in design and still in retail. And Barry's still in acting and yeah. still carrying the most wonderful career. I mean, it has to be said yeah. that he's had the most, he continues to have the best career. But when you were like a little girl, were you play acting? Were you making up things and performing and showing off to your parents and all of that? Yeah, definitely. I had friends here when dad moved to Sydney um I had friends here um John Bell and Anna Volska's daughters um Lucy and Hillary and then we had other friends involved and so we had this sort of like little theater troupe called the Bobs um the Bobs the Bobs because their old from? names all ended in B and mm. mine ended in O so mm. they kind of needed me for the vowel um and we used to write our own shows and put them on every Christmas. What, in the backyard or in the... No, no, in the Belvoir Street <laughs> Theatre. Thank not. you very much. You did not, did you? We did. We used to We used to rope, um, often Leanne, we'd rope Leanne into doing lights and stuff for us and we'd write it and make our own costumes and and rehearse all over the Christmas holidays and then finally put it on and invite lots of actors and people from the industry. It was um, it was pretty audacious, really. Um, not with any view to kind of being actors, but just with the view to that we wanted to put on a show. Can you remember the sensation of actually doing it, of, 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 of being on stage and performing? How old were you now, about eight or nine or ten or something? Um, yeah, I was probably about eight when we first did one. The first one I was really nervous about, but then... The, the next one, I just remember the sensation of people laughing um, in, in a really nice way. Oh, it's heady over stuff, things, isn't it? <laughs> over things that I thought I was being very serious about, but then um, really loving that feeling that, that there was humour in something that I hadn't realised was mm. there. And Has that love of performing for a crowd remained? Yeah, definitely. I, I love you don't get that theater. on a film, do you? No, you don't. You don't get that automatic feedback. And the great thing in theatre is when the curtain goes up, it's your show. I mean, it 
it runs how you want it to run. Whereas with a film, you you give it up, you you go and you m- make a performance, and then it goes into editing, and they do all these other things with it, and you kind of have to let it go. Mm. And it's very much the director's baby, I think. You know, they they really make the film in the editing room. Where did you go to school? Um, various places. I went to school originally in Brisbane, and then we moved for a time to Hong Kong. My mum and my stepfather, he was a jockey, so we moved to Hong Kong where he was riding. So we were there for about a year, and then when we came back, we moved to Brisbane, and then back to uh, then we moved to Newcastle, and I mainly grew up there. Then, when you left school, what were the options? What did you think of? I mean, was acting still happening, or were you? I was acting all the way through with with my friends in that group right up until I was sort of 17 or 18 we were still doing these shows um and i remember very sadly all being together thinking well this is our last show that'll be the end of acting we won't be doing these things anymore and then we've all sort of ended up in the business in mm. one way or another well, hillary bell's a very well-known playwright yes, and lucy and bell's lucy a very well-known well-known actress. actress. Yeah, yeah exactly you went to nida eventually but did you do that straight out of school no, um, I did a film while I was still in high school, and I think it was my last year of high school, um, and that really bit me then. And then, so when I left school, was that the what film was that? Uh, that was called Emma's War. Ah, okay, yeah. And that was with Lee Remick. I was really lucky to work with her. She was very beautiful woman, just very beautiful soul. Um, but what was I saying? Um, so then you, you did a film at school and then yes. when you left school? When I left school, I really wasn't sure what I was going to be. I I'd sort of thought about being a doctor and I got into medicine and then I decided I wanted to defer that for a year. I didn't want to go straight on to study. And then for a time during my teenage years, I had really wanted to be a dancer. I sort of at 13 decided I wanted to be a ballet dancer and then mm. threw myself into hours and hours and hours every week, um, which was probably very good and kept me out of a lot of trouble, really. It probably also hasn't hurt in terms of movement on stage. and that No, sort of no, it's good training to have. Mm. It's, you know, it's definitely really um, useful. But at a certain point, I realised that I wasn't going to be good enough and that I really didn't want to be in the corps de ballet. I sort of wanted to be a little further forward. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so I, I toyed with being a doctor and then, then I just came and I started acting and then I went to NIDA a couple of years later. Did you get in first go, first audition? I did get in first go. What, do you remember the audition? Well, it was two auditions. The first day I turned up, um, <laughs> I turned up and I hadn't, I'd been working at the time I was working on a job and I hadn't had much time to work on the pieces. And I turned up and we did the warm up and then they said, you must have been doing these pieces for your friends and you're doing them in the shower. And I was thinking, I was only learning them last night. Oh, dear. And I ran out of the audition and said, oh, look, I'm not ready to do it. And they allowed me to come back a couple of weeks later. And you did it again. And then I did it. And then I ended up getting in. Was it a good experience, Nida? It was a great experience, and I still have really, really very close friends. I mean, I suppose that's like the equivalent of my university years, really. And I, I learnt a lot, and, and it was just I learnt so much from the from the people in my year, just from just from doing stuff and and watching each other work. But also just to have that freedom to be out of the industry for three years to kind of try stuff that you might be frightened to explore it on a professional level that, mm. that you could be in this sort of hot house environment where you, you're just trying things out, things that were going to, to fail, but you, you learned a lot through that. You could stretch yourself a lot. Does NIDA teach you or did it in your days teach you uh, how to feel safe? How to feel safe? Oh, gosh, can anyone ever teach you how well, to feel I safe? Well, I, I don't know whether feeling safe as an actor is a desirable thing. Do you, I mean, when you're... When you're playing a role such as Elizabeth Bishop that we've been talking about, it, I'm just curious to know from the outside whether it's a business of starting at the at the beginning again to, for each character, or whether there are yes, there are it's always starting that, right from the beginning again because you, you can do something and it it turns out well, and at the end of it you kind of go, oh, this is great. I know exactly how I want to work now and then you come on to the next thing and it's it's like you've never done anything else before at least that's how I feel and then I each there time I have to find are, things in different ways there isn't a little arsenal of techniques that you can go back to and say well here I am confronted by playing a woman much older than I am now therefore you know that sort of th- there are techniques and things that you learn over the years but then on an emotional level, there are there are different keys and different ways into things. Sometimes it's through 
I know I'll often do a lot of research, but a lot of it will end up not being of use to me. Interesting to go through, but it'll be certain things that end up, you know, sort of sticking for me. It must be interesting if you're in a different key, key, if we use a musical sort of thing, from the people you're working with. Does that happen? I mean, did, 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 that people work in different ways, or well, I imagine people work in different ways. But there might, I can imagine also, just in theory, and I don't know whether this is true or not, that you could be on a set of a film and just be not in sync at all with what the person you're doing a scene with is all about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, I that's a really funny more. thing. You know, chemistry is a really interesting thing on films and sometimes you can go onto something that's so well written and everything and it's got all the right people and then something about it just doesn't all come together. Is it up it's, to the director to understand no, that? No, sometimes it's just it's just in the alchemy really, you know, you can't you can't force it to happen and sometimes magic things happen on on things where you think all the elements are going to work against you and yet somehow some kind of magic pulls everything together. Give us an and example of when it's happened with you, when one or the other has happened with you, when you've really felt terrible about, oh, it's not going to work, I'm um, not going to work, and then it just happens somehow. Um <laughs> Well, I know there was a film I did years ago doing time for Patsy Cline mm-hmm. and on that film I, I felt like at times um, w- w- that, that we, I didn't know where we were going with it and, and that was kind of a good thing because then all the actors kind of really worked together and it kind of made everyone really alert to try and work out exactly what we were doing and there was that kind of a feeling and then I, I think it turned out... Um, it surprised me when I saw it. It was it was hmm. so much more interesting than I thought it was going to be. Is acting a, just a job for you? No, no, uh, um, no. Unfortunately, no. It's not just a job for why, me. Why? Why do you act? Why? Do why I are act? you an actor and not? I, there's just a nothing like the thrill of when it's when you can really completely submerge yourself into somebody else and go on that trip and then on on stage there's nothing quite like that feeling of when the audience are with you and you're entirely immersed in the role it is like flying it's it's the best feeling yeah it's an incredible feeling oh you'd be scared i'd be scared that it wasn't going to happen again you know this is going to be the last time this is going to happen yeah i mean there are some that that don't get to that stage there are things that you do and they they consistently feel kind of clunky and it never quite comes together. But then there are others that, that just kind of soar. Mm. And that's that's a really amazing feeling and the kind of thing, you know, that you keep going back for to try and get again. It's wonderful being in the audience when you feel that happening too, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that everything just kind of rolls on from the next thing. And yeah, 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 it is. It's very exciting. Let's hear some more music, Miranda. And Jacqueline Dupre with Elgar, Cello Concerto. Why is this? I just think it's a really beautiful piece. I mean, I actually first heard this on a television show. I think it was Paradise Postponed. That's exactly right. Donald Pleasance was in it. And I just loved it every night. And so it's just a a piece that I... That you love. It's very English. Oh, it's such a beautiful piece of music, isn't it? such a beautiful piece. That's the famous recording by Jacqueline Dupre, although lots of other cellists have recorded it. But that's the kind of landmark one, I think, made Mm. a long while ago. First movement from the Elgar Cello Concerto, chosen by Miranda Otto. What's it like working in Hollywood? When did you first go to work in on the West Coast? Uh, I think one of the first things I did, I did uh, film Terence Malick's Thin Red Line and then um, we shot some of it here and then he wanted to do more of the flashback sequence so I went over to the States. And, um, was it a different atmosphere working there? Is it, <gasps> is it different? It's a, it's a similar setup, and so there's a familiarity to it but, but it's sort of more... At some levels, I would say it's more hierarchical. There's a more egalitarian kind of system that we have in Australia where people will kind of help each other on each other's jobs, where I I sometimes feel in Hollywood that, you know, everybody's in different compartments and certain people speak to each other, whereas in Australia it's much more sort of social in the film industry. People are... are, um, sort of socialise more with each other and mm. um, I'm not afraid. To, I mean, I've, I've had it happen on an American set where, you know, it started to rain so I picked up some of the other people's equipment and they're like, put that down, that's union, you're not allowed to do oh, that. Like, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, gosh, <laughs> yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah. When you work alongside someone or opposite or along in the same cast as someone like Tom Cruise or Harrison Ford or Michelle Pfeiffer or any of those people who are very big stars, mm-hmm. Are they also very good actors, do you think, mostly? 
Yeah, I think, and they're also, you know, to me, those really sort of A-list people that, that I've worked with have also been very generous when I've worked with them and put a lot of time into um, creating the scenes. I remember Michelle Pfeiffer saying, do you want to sit and read through lines? And um, with Tom Cruise, I remember these scenes that we did in War of the Worlds that he he really wanted to work on the scenes and add extra bits and put humour in them. And he, he really worked on them with me in, in a great way because I guess he realised it was sort of important for his character that the mm. backstory come across and um, I, I find generally those people are really generous. How did you get the role in the Peter Jackson trilogy? Well, the second of the t- second and third of the trilogy, The Lord of the Rings. I, um, I put down tape for it here in Australia. Um, what did you choose to do or did they say what they wanted no, to do? No, they, they chose two scenes I think that I had to do and I had to do them with it, both an English and an American accent because they hadn't decided yet whether the character may have an American accent. I'm so glad they didn't make me do that. That would have mm. been crazy. Although you do a very damn good American accent. I know, but it, it really wouldn't have fitted into that world no, at all no. to have an American accent. Like That was not the landscape that they were doing at all. But yes, I do remember having to do two scenes and having to do both of them twice, like get to the end of a scene and think, oh, well, that went well. Oh, now I've got to redo it again with an American accent. Ah, uh, yeah. But um, yeah, I just put down tape and then um, sent it off. Did you have any idea that those films were going to be so successful? Well, to be honest, when I read the films originally, they sent me the scripts and the the covers on them were around the wrong way. So I read the third one and then the second one and so I was totally confused and I didn't know what was going on. Um, and when I was offered the role, I said to my agent here, I don't know, should I take it because I'm kind of working in America and maybe I should just keep doing that at the moment? And she said, no, 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 darling, I think you should take it. So I took it and then they flew me over there and I got to see, because they'd already started shooting, and I got to see what they'd started shooting and I was so excited. I was like sort of, I couldn't sleep that night. I was so excited They're to be part of it. They're spectacular films, It was from they? the beginning of just seeing what they'd already shot and going to Weta and looking at the effects and just being on the set and watching other people work. I just, I I couldn't believe my luck. I, I just thought, this is going to be huge and this is something that I'll show my children one day. And indeed you will. Well, I, I must will. have already. The, the No, not yet. I'm, ah, I'm right. waiting. Yes, I think it's a little bit scary yet. You had to ride horses, you had to yep. fight, you had to do all sorts of things, didn't yes. you? Was it, I mean, does that, obviously you have to learn how to ride a horse. And Yeah, I love getting to, I mean, that's a great thing as an actor. You go on things and you get to learn new skills and dabble in areas that you, you may not have gotten to do in your life. You know, no, but of, physically the demands were pretty great, I imagine. Because yes, I had were. a look at the at one of them the other day on a, the DVD yeah. and you were wearing kind of cha- chain <laughs> mail. Chain mail. Yeah. Was it made of? styrofoam so no it, it wasn't it was m- it was sort of like a, a new technology that they invented because they invented so many things on that shoot that was the other sort of amazing thing of working on it you were sort of dealing with people who were, were inventing new ways to do things but they it was it was still heavy because it was metal coated so it was like a plastic that was metal coated mm. so it was still had a lot of weight but not as bad as it would have been if you it was metal. You'd be fit as a flea when you stop doing that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember doing that fight with the Witch King and ending up with a bruise, I mean an enormous bruise all the way down my thigh that was hard and black and oh God. took a long time scars to of, get rid scars of. Scars of work. Yeah, Miranda, let's hear your next piece which is a song from Galt McDermott. What are we hearing? Um, this is Coffee Cold. Um, this is a really personal one because this is um, what my husband and I danced to at our wedding. Um, Are you we, gonna cry again? No, I'm not. I promise. <laughs> um, I um, he he found this piece of music. We heard something in a bar, and then it, he looked up the original piece of music that it came from, and so we used this as as our wedding dance. And it it was really great because my husband's actually a really great dancer. He grew up in the country. He used to go to the sixty forty dances with his parents, and you know, dance with his aunties and uncles. So he truly knows how to dance. And his mum actually helped us the night before. Um, work out a bit of a dance routine to it so it was it was very cool and I'll always remember it the song people choose for their wedding dance <laughs> that's a beauty it's called coffee cold coffee cold and it was Galt McDermott and chosen by Miranda Otto Miranda um the film you've completed with Tommy Lee Jones when I was thinking about Tommy Lee Jones this morning I thought it's not Tommy Lee that was Pamela Anderson's husband and it's not Billy Bob Thornton, who's got a triple-barreled <laughs> name. 
Tommy Lee Jones is a force to be reckoned with, I he think, is, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Now, he starred in it and directed it. And wrote it. And wrote the, it. I, it was involved in the writing of it. Yeah, I think there were three writers and he was one of them. What yeah. was it like working along, being directed by someone that you were actually acting alongside? I've never done that before. So it was absolutely fascinating watching somebody do that and how sort of seamlessly he glided from one job to the next. It was really? so it was so funny watching someone be completely in a scene and at the end of it and you're watching him and watching him on the monitor and then he goes, cut. <laughs> and so he would cut his own scenes. So he didn't have the assistant director to direct him in the scenes he was in? No, 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 no. And then he would just watch things back and, and see what he liked. And Is he a see, great actor? He's a great actor. He He's, I mean, I don't know if you um, saw, um, what was it, Lincoln that he was in recently. Oh, he's so who wonderful. Did he play in Lincoln? I can't remember the character's name, but he's wonderful. I he, love that film. Yeah, yeah. And he, when he comes on, he, he makes everyone else look like they're acting. Do you know what I mean? He just sort of, he has this way of acting where you don't even realise that he's begun. It's it's so kind of um, mm. seamless and natural. And and he's um, <coughs> incredibly intelligent. Like he's um, he's sometimes a little scary to be around because you, you're frightened of making a mistake. <laughs> And as a director of you, I mean, when when you compare him with other directors, they've all got their modus operandi, I guess, have they? Well, being an actor, I think he just has a really clear sense of what actors need to hear. And he, you know, would give you little gifts of ideas that he had had f for scenes. And, and he knew to kind of um, keep direction kind of to a minimum. He, mm. he quickly works out what kind of things he needs to say to you. So when's The Homesman coming out? Well, I believe in the States, I think it's November 7th, or, or at least right. it's November, I know that much. What's next for you? What are you doing next? Ooh, isn't that a good question? I'm trying to work <laughs> that out. There's actually a couple of things here in Australia that I'm really interested in doing, so I, I might be doing that. But um, I moved to America about a year and a half ago, and I have my daughter in school there, and she's due to about go back to school, so now it's... it's, it's <laughs> Uh, it's a conundrum. Uh, it is, isn't it? Yeah, but high you, quality problems. As soon Margaret, as you make the decision, yeah. But as soon as you make the decision to go over there, something will happen here. It seems that's to be the, the way, way you have of the to world. do it. You have yep. to make plans. If you kind of sit on the fence and try to be available for everything, nothing happens. And as soon as you book a holiday or move somewhere else, then you can be guaranteed that. That It'll something happen. will come up it's that the will take you elsewhere. We'll have to end. Um, your final choice is called, it's, well, it's called Maria Mari. What is it? Um, this is um, Neapolitan singer Roberto Morolo, who um, I did a film in Naples years ago and someone gave me a CD and I just think his voice is beautiful. And um, when I was doing A Doll's House with my husband, I um, used to listen to this a lot. Was that on that set that you met your husband? Yes, okay. yes, it was, yeah, doing the play. And um, I just think he has a beautiful voice and I quite often listen to these pieces. This is just one. Maria Marie, that was sung by Roberto Morolo and was the final choice of Miranda Otto. Thanks for listening to this special feature from ABC Classic. You can find more interviews, as well as many other stories and features and concerts, over on our website at abc.net.au slash classic.